Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm very excited uh, to, to visit in person in the future. Uh, so today my talk is going to be on uh, this title, New Analytic Probes of, uh, of Effective Field Theory. And uh, I thought I would start uh, here, in the middle of a maze. So you or we are here, right in the center of this, this, this big maze. And when you're in a maze, you want to explore your immediate surroundings. And so you start making little explorations around the point that you find yourself at, that we find ourselves at. And we are physicists. And so this exploration that we're doing here is we're making the, the most accessible measurements that we can, we can make in, in, in our experiments. And one of the things that we, we, we strive to do is to build experiments with greater sensitivity, whether it be greater precision or higher energy and explore further away from our position in the maze and look for, for perhaps exciting or interesting features such as this, this bridge you see here. So consider this maze to be a QFT describing nature, something like the, the standard model QFT. So we want the full picture of this maze. That's, that's what we strive to do. That means we, we want to know the all possible measurements we could possibly make within this theory. And all, po all possible measurements is another way of saying we want to know what the S matrix uh, of this theory is, of this quantum field theory. So I'm going to be talking about S matrix of, 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 of a QFT, and this is, uh, this is embodying the idea of every possible physical measurement that you can make in this, in this theory. So on the experimental side of things, we can build a particle collider and do an experiment. We can collide particles and make measurements of these particles that, that, that come out of the collider and measure their momentum, their energy. On the theory side, we can probe the, the S matrix. I'm going to talk about probing the, uh, the S matrix analytically. Of course, you can also do this numerically. And we have been doing this for a long time uh, in quantum field theory. S matrix theory of the 60s um, uh, was, was um, developed to, to probe the S matrix of, of, of QCD in particular. Uh, a lot of the ideas from this, this, uh, um, this program on shell uh, unitarity, the ideas of locality have, have found application in uh, modern altitude techniques, uh, in particular uh, in techniques that have been important to, to do the calculations that have been necessary for the, for the LHC program. And there's been activity, uh, recent activity in attempts to, to bootstrap the S matrix. So taking ideas from the CFT bootstrap. In fact, uh, there was a talk earlier at this, uh, this conference by Pedro uh, on exactly this. These first principle attacks, uh, such as directly bootstrapping the S matrix or S matrix theory, um, uh, represent a very challenging task. This is a difficult task. So I'm going to ask a slightly different question, and it's going to be a simpler question. What about a blueprint of the theory? So here, a blueprint of the maze. Somehow there's less information. There's maybe no rendering. You don't understand all the twists and turns, or the, the fact that there might be bridges or a pagoda up here. But there a blueprint can reveal potentially important structures and features and uh, and it can make these apparent so and in some sense this should be an easier uh, object to to try and study uh, than than a full s matrix so this is this this talk is about an analytic blueprint for relativistic field theories uh, it's a blueprint for the s matrix uh, upon which all relativistic EFTs must be built. And I use the word s matrix and EFT somewhat interchangeably because they mean the same thing. It just means making all possible measurements that you can make. Okay, so this is my talk outline. How to use this blueprint. I'm gonna, obviously I'm gonna tell you what, a blue, what the blueprint is and I'm gonna give you two, two sort of applications. The first is in applying the standard model as an EFT at the LHC. So this, this standard model EFT, how is it used at the LHC, and what can this blueprint? How can this blueprint help in, in practical questions and in phenomenological questions? And the second, uh, the second part of my talk will be uh, uh, more theoretical, uh, using this uh, this blueprint as a as a as a novel analytic probe of the of the S matrix. Okay, so let me first start by uh, by talking about this as uh, as applied to the uh, EFT at the LHC. So this is part one of the talk and it's on the more phenomenological side. Okay, so this is a plot of uh, the uh, measurements made by the ATLAS experiment, uh, the, uh, the Large Hadron Collider, and along the x-axis here 
you can see um, various combinations of the standard model uh, particles. And on the y-axis, there's a measure of the cross-section for producing this, this combination of particles in a proton-proton collision. So this is a measure of how often you expect uh, this combination of particles to be produced at the LHC. And there are two, uh, there's, there, there are two color codes on this plot to look at. There's a, there's a gray bands, which are theoretical predictions within the standard model theory. And the pink bands are experimental measurements. And you can see a beautiful agreement uh, across many decades of, uh, of, uh, between theory and experiment. So the types of particles, standard model particles that are being produced and cross sections that are being measured are those of electroweak bosons, photons, top anti-top particles. There's this huge spectrum of possible measurements uh, that, uh, that are being made at the, at the LAC. And let me just focus on this particular uh, column here. So this is a column uh, that's important to the IEC program. It's the column that, that's to do with the, the Higgs boson. There's a, there's a sort of chromatography in this column and uh, the, different, uh, the different entries here are depending on how the Higgs boson decays. So for example, one of these measurements here is uh, the, 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 the production of a Higgs boson, for instance, in fusing two gluons together and then the Higgs boson then decaying into, into two photons. Now, as well as measuring this, this spectrum of standard model particles, the LHC is also searching for physics beyond the standard model. We know that it exists, and uh, history and aesthetics sort of points to, to us seeing it at the LHC. And there's two ways in which you can search for new physics at the LHC. One of them is a direct uh, way, directly search for it, directly produce the new particles, in which case you can add another column to this, this plot and, uh, and measure their, their production cross-section. That's the second way, and that's a, a more indirect way, and that's the way that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, so this indirect searches for new physics, you can, I, I've converted now on the, on the other y-axis, so on the right-hand side of this plot now, are the, uh, the, the total number of events that you would expect to see at the high luminosity LHC. And so this uses the fact that you're going to have large statistics, and it's going to have parallels with the CMB measurements. And you should think of each of these processes that uh, these, these particular particles and combinations is the sort of the CMB photons in the LHC. We have a lot of them. We're measuring their production. What can we do with them? And, there's, and the parallels go, go deep as well because it, these are giving us a window into the early universe. Uh, there's this, uh, there's, there's a, a notion of precision. That you have precision measurements because you have a lot of them. You have very good statistics and good systematics. And there's uh, precision theory calculations within the standard model with which to compare. And you can search for anisotropies in the standard model measurements. This whole story actually can be made very surprise, uh, very precise. Uh, and in fact, in a couple of papers, that are not, they're not gonna be the, the, the subject of my talk today. Um, we showed how you can uh, mathematically define the power spectrum of the standard model. So you can really talk about uh, you know, measuring these anisotropies uh, in, 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 uh, in data, de deviations from the standard model really as, as as a power spectrum uh, measurement uh, in, in direct analogy with the cosmic microwave background. But today I'm just I, I'm going to talk about a slightly different aspect of this and it's this, this idea of making a blueprint uh, of an EFT and, 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 uh, and how it can help. So what is EFT? So EFT is a universal concept. It has diverse applications from condensed matter physics to cosmology. So today I'm focusing on relativistic EFT, but in some sense there's a, there's a broader sense in which, uh, in which these ideas apply. And this EFT is the framework in which uh, you can search for these uh, indirect effects of new physics at, at colliders. Um, it can parameterize the unknown, which makes it powerful. It gives you a, a way to quantitatively discuss these anisotropies in the, in the LAC data. Okay, so how does it work? So historically, the existence of the W and Z bosons uh, of the standard model was inferred from, uh, from beta decay. So beta decay is a process that involves a, a, a neutron, a proton, uh, an electron, and a neutrino. So at low energies, uh, we, we know at high energies, we know what happens. The, the, the quarks uh, uh, interact with the W boson, which then interacts with the, the leptons. At low energies, this proceeds by, by just Heisenberg's uncertainty uh, relation. And what does EFT tell you to do? Well, EFT tells you to take the low energy particles of the theory, the proton, the neutron, the electron, and the neutrino, and make a coordinate chart out of them, a, a basis, I'm gonna use that word uh, in this talk, of operators that you, you get by just sticking these things, sticking these, uh, these fields together. Oh, so fields that correspond to these, these particles. So for instance, the, this, this interaction proceeds, uh, 
uh, via a, an operator that connects the proton, the neutron, and the electron, and the neutrino. And these, these fields have some contraction of their, their field indices together. But this is, this is what it is. So I will be talking about the, the EFT that's relevant for the, the LHC. That's the standard model uh, EFT, which is the same in the same way as the as the uh, the beta EFT, beta decay EFT. You just make a coordinate chart out of all the particles uh, in your low energy theory. In this case, that's going to be all the particles in the standard model here. So, for instance, you can make a coordinate chart um, out of uh, a Higgs operator, a top quark, a W boson, and a, and a bottom quark. And these interactions are just polynomials in these particle operators and derivatives. Uh, and uh, the EFT, um, the mantra is that they, they have to be Lorentz invariant, you have to contract the indices of these, these fields, and they have to respect the symmetries of the standard model. So you have to write down uh, singlets under the, the gauge symmetries of the standard model. But that's it. And you just write down all operators. And this, this, this chart, this coordinate chart, and this basis can be organized just, uh, just using dimensional analysis. So here, you can, um, you can count the mass dimension of each operator given the, the canonical mass dimension of the fields. And you can organize this in an inverse powers of some, some large energy to make up the, the, the mass dimension so the total Lagrangian mass dimension form. And this, this, this lambda here, this capital lambda is a, is, a, is a large scale. So it corresponds to a suppression. So uh, just to introduce some terminology, uh, these operators that have mass dimension five, uh, mass dimension six, this expansion is called uh, expansion of mass dimension. These C's are the coupling parameters. And typically you expect the, the higher mass dimension operators to be uh, less phenomenologically important because they're gonna be suppressed by some larger scale. It's not always the case, but uh, typically that's, that's, that's right. And you can see already this, uh, this picture, this idea that I was giving you a few slides ago uh, of, um, of searching for an isotropy is the standard model Lagrangian here is like the isotropic uh, piece. And then these higher order terms in this EFT expansion are these, these anisotropies that we want to search for that will signal deviations from the standard model and signal the effect of new physics. So just to emphasize here, the physics is really sits in these coefficients uh, here, these Cs, uh, Wilson coefficients of the EFT. Whereas the operators themselves, this sort of um, gluing together of fields and different combinations, is kind of like a choice of coordinate system. There's many different choices you can make. There's many different bases in which you can expand your EFT. Uh, and, and these are the kind of, this, this kind of charts of these choice of coordinate systems, understanding these coordinate systems, this is what I mean by understanding the blueprint uh, of, of a theory, rather than the, the, the physics itself, which hangs upon this, these, these coefficients, it's understanding something much simpler, um, uh, which is understanding the, just the chart itself. Okay, and so for instance, just to give you an example of how this works and how you can use EFTs to quantitatively search uh, or constrain new physics at the LHC, you can imagine that this or one of these operators will contribute, will, will affect and modify the, the interaction of the Higgs with two photons. So in this process, uh, where, the, where you have a Higgs decaying to photon photons, this operator, if you like, you can calculate a final rule from it. You can, you can work out how it modifies the Higgs decaying into photons, Higgs interacting. And so going back to this, this, uh, this plot that I showed at the, the start, there is a measurement and there's a theoretical prediction in the standard model, and they agree with each other within errors. And so the fact that we don't see a deviation from this puts a constraint on this particular, uh, this particular coefficient. And so these Cs are constrained by the cross-section measurements. And so this is a way to quantitatively put, uh, put constraints on whatever new physics is modifying this via some sort of quantum loops, if you like, these in the same way as the W boson, you know, modified this interaction that led to, 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 to beta decay. And this, in the Higgs is obviously not the only place that you can search for these, these uh, effects of high, uh, high dimensional operators. They can also modify other processes as well. So for instance, different coefficients uh, will modify, for example, top decay of the LHC, or modify the interaction between the top quark, a bottom quark, and a W boson. Measurements of these coefficients will form uh, a, an important part of the high luminosity LHC program. This is going to be a sort of a legacy of the LHC will be a, a measurement of these, the constraints on, on the Wilson coefficients phrased in the, uh, the framework of the standard model EFT. So it's an important legacy in the same way as the, the, the lap electro measurements were. 
So what's the, the issue that I want to talk about here? So how complicated is it to do this? It turns out that it's actually quite complicated to write down um, uh, a, uh, the, the standard model, the Lagrangian terms in the standard model EFT. And so this is a, this, this, um, this is a chart that sort of gives the history of, uh, of, of this endeavor. So along the x-axis in this chart is mass dimension. So writing down all operators at mass dimension five, six, and so on in the, in the standard model EFT. And on the y-axis is just, I'm just counting the total number, never mind what the, the, what the field content of these things is, just the total number of the, the, the operators, independent operators. Independent is going to be the key word here in the standard model EFT. And uh, this, the, the arrows sort of show literature that, uh, that, that, uh, that obtain these numbers. Um, and in the red arrows show uh, numbers that are either overcomplete or undercomplete. So either op there were too many operators, so there's redundancy uh, in the sort of counting of the number of physical measurements you can make, or there was uh, they were undercomplete. There, there, were, there were operators or measurements that one could make that were missed. The green arrow showed the the the, the, um, uh, the, the numbers in the literature that were correct. And, but you can see this is a tricky business because these incorrect numbers are under fifty percent of the of the literature. And so why is it tricky? Well, the tricky business is that there are relations between these operators. And I'll come back to these relations in a little bit, but these, the fact that they're not all linearly independent makes it, makes it tricky. And so that's why these numbers are, are difficult to, uh, to come by and to construct. And so in these, in a series of papers with my collaborators here, this was the, the issue that we, 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 we wanted to tackle. Uh, and so I want to tell you a little bit, uh, uh, just broadly overview the, the, the methods that we use to, to overcome these tricky businesses and to actually write down this uh, or systematize this construction of EFT, not just for the standard model, but in, in, in general. So the, the kind of key thing really is to, is to not consider just a subset of the operators that are maybe the, the most phenomenologically important ones. It's actually to start and think about the entire set of operators that you can possibly write down, which is infinite. So there's an infinitely many polynomials, uh, you know, monomials you can make out of fields and standard models that goes on forever. But when you start to think about the whole set of operators, you can start to see structures appear. So for instance, this is me writing down each of these blue squares corresponds to some operator that you can write down. And you've just written down, you can imagine all possible operators you can write down. And when you write it down like this, you start to realize that there are relations between the operators. There are operations that you can take. You can start with an operator that I called here of 09, and you can, uh, you can act on it. You can you can make you can take this operator from O9 to, to connect it with some other operator. And there's another action that you can do to take this operator uh, to another operator. And you start to see that uh, under under this uh, this um, this action, uh, these operators uh, sort of connect to each other. And you can imagine that you're combing out. There's a comb in which you're untangling a thread of operators and moving from one to the one to the next, and they're all connected by the application of this 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 comb operation. And when you when you realize this, you also realize that you can back comb. So you can you can comb out a, a hair if you like in this this infinite space of operators. You can also go back along this hair using, using a, a backwards comb. And you can do this all the way. You can start here and you can do it all the way until you get back to 09. And you can comb again and you get to 04. But then you might find that after, when, once you get to some particular operator, you try and back comb again, but you, you, you annihilate this operator. You get nothing. And so the, the, this back combing terminates. You sort of reach the, 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 the scalp or the follicle operator. And this should sound vaguely uh, reminiscent of, uh, of a simple quantum uh, mechanics uh, example, the harmonic oscillator, where you can go between states. So you can you have a raising operator, a dagger that you can apply infinitely many times and sort of connect infinitely many states in this way. And similarly, there's a there's a there's a lowering operator, this a, and you can move back down this sort of tower of states. But there's some state that eventually you get to and you apply a to it and you annihilate this into the vacuum state. So this this is this is the sort of picture. And so you can you can comb out this whole uh, series of uh, series of operators and you can you can start to organize it using this this combing principle. But you see what's going to be important here is that the, the, these follicle operators are going to be important. Uh, these ones here where the comb the back comb terminates. These are sort of special special operators. Now let me tell you a little bit about what this comb is, this, this operation is. Now I'm now going to tell you that the comb is a, a derivative. So the comb operation is uh, just 
taking an operator and applying a derivative to it. So why is that important? So I told you that there are relations. So this, this tells you that uh, the, the uh, operator nine here, this red operator here, is nothing more than the derivative of operator four. But if an operator is a total derivative, then it's zero. We assume that this just vanishes at, uh, at the boundary. So total, total derivative operators don't contribute to, to the S matrix. And this is the key to really understanding these, in, these relations uh, between operators that I told you about. So now I'll give them a, a term. They're called integration by parts relations. And what doing, you know, organizing the, the, uh, the operator space using these cones into these sort of hairs and these lines of connected operators is that it really organizes these IVP relations, these integration by parts relations. So for instance, if one of these operators you can think of as sort of composite A, B, C operator, and you, you know that you've got to it by applying the cones. So you know that it's a derivative uh, of, of this ABC operator. So somewhere down this, this hair, you know this is zero. But if you use the chain rule, uh, the, the, the product rule, you, you apply this derivative by the product rule, you get some combination of operators that is not obviously zero just by staring at them. You have to combine them in this particular way. And so there's a relation between these operators that, that combines them to be zero. So it reduces the number of independent operators. However, by organizing, you're using this combing, you know where all your, your total derivative operators are. They lie somewhere down, somewhere down the line. Whereas the, the operators uh, that are not going to be total derivatives are these, these ones on the far left-hand side, these follicle operators. So now let me tell you what the backcomb is. So the, the backcomb operation is the, uh, the action of a uh, 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 special conformal generator. So it's, uh, it, I'm calling K here. And these operations are generators of the, the symmetry group, the, the conformal symmetry group. And so these hairs are representations of this group. Okay, so that's, that's the sort of observation that there's some kind of representation theory and doing this combing out uh, and backcombing, there's some representation theory understanding going into this. And as soon as you have representation theory, as soon as you know that there's representation theory in the game, you can now turn to 19th century mathematics. Because you see what we want to do is we want to, uh, we want to count the number of follicle operators because these are the counting the number of non-total derivative operators. These are gonna be the independent operators in the operator bases. And so there are systematic ways for doing this in, using invariant theory of 19th century mathematics that was in fact uh, instigated and developed by, by Hilbert. Of, of physics fame. And so there are systematic procedures that you can do to count these. So you can imagine now there's a black box that you take in, you put into the black box the, the field content of the standard model, the mass dimension that you might like. And uh, this, this box uses this, this conformal representation theory to sort of organize all the, the, the relations between the operators uh, and count the number of, just count the number of representations you're interested in. And so this black box does a little bit of magic and it puts out this blueprint. And so this blueprint uh, is, is the one that I'm talking about, and this is, this is the subject of this talk. It's a blueprint for the standard model EFT or the, the, the S matrix of this, this theory, if you like. Blueprint for the, the possible measurements you can make, these Wilson coefficients. And so what does it actually look like? Well, this, this, this is termed a Hilbert series. So the output of this, this black box is termed a Hilbert series. And it is a, it's a polynomial. It's a polynomial in variables. So you can see different named variables here. So let me tell you what this does a little bit. So H stands here for, for Higgs. It's not really a field, it's just a variable that has the same name. So you can think of it as, it's not really an operator. This is not an operator, although it looks a bit like a Lagrangian, it's not. Uh, and there's, there, are, there are variables for each of the fields in the standard model. And this thing is a, a polynomial, it's a sum of all these, of these, um, these different terms. And what these terms tell you, there's a coefficient in, terms of each, in front of each of these terms, and this tells you how many independent operators there are at mass dimension six in the standard model EFT. And so the fact that there's a one in front of here and a one in front of here tells me that there's one operator that I can write down out of uh, six Higgs fields. Or here, it tells me that there's two operators that I can make out of four quark fields. And so this number, the total number of independent operators loses this sort of information about what, what type of operators there are, but you can just set all of these variables to one. So you count one plus one plus two plus one plus one plus two and so on. Uh, and you sum it up and you find that at mass dimension six, this black box tells you that there are 84 operators here. Okay, 
And so that uh, turns this, uh, this plot into the following plot. There's a, it's a systematic procedure. So I should say here that these two lines, uh, the, the, the lower blue line is considering the standard model with just one generation of fermions. And the, the, up, the upper line is considering the standard model with, uh, with three generations of fermions. And so applying this, this technique, generating this sort of blueprint of the EFT, this, 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 this blueprint that told you about the number of independent operators, you can start to build up in a systematic way how many uh, independent operators there are at various mass dimensions in the standard model EFT. And so importantly, this gave the first determination of the, uh, the, the dimension eight, the, the, the content of the dimension eight, uh, mass dimension eight, uh, Lagrangian in the standard model EFT. Uh, I'll come back to that in a little, uh, but this, this has phenomenological importance for this, these LHC measurements and this LHC legacy. The other thing that this, this, this plot told us is that we can go as high as we like. And so at some point we, we stopped and this is, we, we stopped at, at the point where you could give um, a, an operator to, in the standard model EFT to every single person in the world at, in, in, uh, in 2017 at least, anyway. Okay, so that, that solved a problem. That solved a, a historical problem, uh, and, it, uh, and it gave rise to some phenomenologically important uh, um, uh, results for the LHC. And so that was the, the use of this blueprint, uh, part one of my talk, in, in applying it to the standard model EFT at the, at the LHC. And so I, I'm now going to turn to the, the second part of my talk, which is using this as a, as a new analytic probe um, of the S matrix. And the, these parts will be somewhat interconnected. So they'll be talking between the same ideas will, will come up again. And so this is work that I recently did uh, with uh, my collaborator, Sridip Pal. So this is, a, this is a very recent paper. Okay, so let me, let me return to the, uh, to the plot that I just showed. So one of the things that, uh, um, that is often commented on is that wow, these operators grow fast. So you start off with two operators, or let's, let's just look at the, the bottom line here, two operators uh, at mass dimension five, these are the, the Weinberg neutrino mass operators. At dimension six, there's suddenly 84. Dimension seven, there's a little dip. This little dip comes about just because uh, it's, it's harder to, to make odd mass dimension operators. Uh, um, but then uh, when you get to mass dimension eight, there's this number 993. And so this tells you that somehow there are 993 independent coefficients to, to measure, uh, which, uh, it, you know, it, there's an explosion. And so why is this growing so fast? And so one thing I like, I'd like to do is to give a kind of intuitive feel as to why the number of operators here is, is growing so quickly, in fact, clearly growing exponentially. And so for this, I, I turn to a, a different EFT. So let's, let's consider an EFT of Lego. So these are these are little. These are supposed to be drawings of uh, of Lego blocks. These are you know, two by two, two by two Lego blocks that you can stick together. And so here's the question in this in this Lego EFT. The the kind of analogous question is how many distinct ways are there to combine these two by two blocks of uh, uh, this, of the same color? So distinct, I mean that if you combine them together and you can rotate them, uh, and make it look the same, then those two ways are not distinct. So this, there's also a kind of redundancy problem here in the same way as there is in the, in the standard model EFT. Uh, okay, so we start off, well, if there's one block, uh, mass dimension or Lego dimension one, there's only one, one way to combine, there's just one thing, there's nothing to do, so the answer is one. So when you have two, two by two blocks, I'll give you a minute, uh, Del, I'll give you a few seconds to think about, about how many possible ways that there are of sticking these Lego blocks together to make uh, different structures. <clears throat> and so the answer is that there are three. Uh, and these are the three ways shown. So you can put it directly on top. You can stick it where, where two of the blocks connect or you can stick it where one of the blocks connect. And of course, the, there are sort of four ways of doing this, uh, doing each of these, but you can, you can rotate them into each other. And so that's, that's the sort of slightly tricky thing, uh, but um, but there are there are three three distinct ways in which you can do this. And I want to now give you the the the, the picture, the connection to to the the operator construction problem. So this is really not actually too far away. You can think of each of these these Lego blocks, each of these sort of sticky outy bits. So this one can uh, corresponds to a Lorentz index of an operator. Each of the sort of any bits of this one corresponds to another Lorentz index here. And so when you stick them together like this. 
what you've done is you've sort of contracted all your Lorentz indices of the operator, and you've, you've built an operator that is Lorentz invariant, a single that could sit inside the Lagrangian. Uh, and then in these cases, you've just contracted two indices or one index, so there's sort of three indices sticking away. But the, the sort of the operational uh, way in which you can combine these blocks is very similar to the operational way in which uh, in which you can combine um, you can combine operators or uh, fields to, to make operators. And so this really has the same flavor. Uh, okay, and now so let's let's think a little bit about uh, a little bit about growth. So now we have three. Uh, three of these two by two blocks, how many ways are there, uh, are there to combine them? Uh, so I actually came up with this, uh, this EFT when I was playing Lego with, with my son. This is, this is actually about a year ago, just after, after my daughter was born. So I was terribly tired and I had these three Lego blocks and it took me a very long time to convince myself that this was the correct answer, that there are, there are in fact 31 ways, a surprising number of ways, there are 31 ways in which you can combine these, these three Lego blocks together to make, uh, to make it indistinguishable and, and you know, trying to, to, to work out which of these are not, you know, cannot be rotated to each other uh, when, you're, when you're tired is, is, is very difficult. But, uh, but this was the right answer. And I know it was the right answer because once I, once I decided upon it, I went to the internet uh, and, and checked to see if anyone had done this before. And of course, somebody had done this before. And in fact, uh, a mathematician had, um, had worked out the, the number of ways to combine Lego blocks up to, uh, uh, up to 11 Lego blocks. And so here you see the, the, the number of ways, again, is exponentially growing. So this gives you a feel of, you know, a kind of constructive operational feel of why this, this, this grows uh, exponentially. And you can see uh, in Lego Mass Dimension 10, uh, again, you have uh, enough to, to give a distinct combination to everyone in the world, protected world population in, in, in 2057. So this also grows you know, very quickly. And so in this sense, this, this, this growth of the standard model EFT is, is, is perhaps a bit more understandable. So why am I interested in growth? Why am I telling you about growth? Clearly this is not for Smeft uh, Fino. This is not going to be something, you know, the LHC is not going to go and measure uh, 7 billion uh, different measurements in the standard model EFT at mass dimension 15. I'll talk a little bit about you know, the, 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 um, the troubles faced already at mass dimension eight with, the, with around a thousand operators. So as I've been emphasizing, this EFT is quantifying all these possible measurements that you can make in, 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 in scattering experiments. So what it's really telling us about this growth of operators is telling us about the growth of the number of possible measurements we can make in a theory, in, in principle. And this is telling us uh, uh, about the, 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 the growth in the degeneracy, the number of entries, no, the number of possible entries of the S matrix. And so if you can study this growth, especially if you can study it analytically, this gives you some new probe of the S matrix. It's just, a, just probing the, de the degeneracy. So it's this simpler idea. It's just a simpler blueprint, but it's, it's some analytic probe. And so this, again, to, to connect to the ideas that I showed in my, my introduction, uh, introdu introduction slides, this analytic probes of the S matrix in particular um, have been enjoying um, a recent resurgence. Uh, and so there's some references here. And also, this is the study of the high temperature behavior of a theory. So you're looking at the entropy of the high energy states in the theory, or the high mass dimension states. Uh, thinking of mass dimension as some measure of some sort of scaling dimension of energy. And there are famous results for, for, for this in D is equal to 2, uh, due to Cardi, uh, where uh, and these are the, 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 um, the growth of, uh, uh, of these, uh, the entropy of the, the high energy states uh, was a, an important check on the ADS-CFT correspondence as well. Much less is known in D greater than two. Uh, and Cardi had a, had, has a paper that, that gives the leading behavior of scalar theories in there from the 90s. But uh, other, than, other than that, uh, very little is known. And so this is, a, this is a new thing to study. So to do that, let's look inside the box a little bit. So inside this, this this Hilbert series box that's giving us this blueprint. Well, what it's essentially doing is it's giving us a, a partition function. So this black box produces this blueprint is some kind of a partition function of, a, of the three of the free theory, just sticking together free fields and, and you can remember, in, in, in making operators, for example. So let me just retain just the information about uh, the spectrum of the, the theory. So this is a, a free theory. So it's just going to be 
it's going to be discrete spectrum. So this is just to be each operator will have uh, uh, energy that is just the sum of the canonical dimensions of the operators. And then let me just retain the information about the, de de the degeneracies. And so this is a, this is a this is how you can construct the partition function of the free theory. I've been talking about um, uh, counting Lorentz singlets because these are the operators that can sit inside a Lagrangian. And so that's a slightly different partition function, this Hilbert series, or this, this blueprint for, for, for the S matrix. You only consider, again, things that are Lorentz singlets. And here, the degeneracies are exactly these numbers here. So this, uh, this uh, delta n, when, del when, when n is equal to 8, say, uh, and so at mass dimension 8, this degeneracy is, is 993 in the standard model EFT uh, with, um, with one generation of fermions. And I'm, I'm sort of, again, I'm, I'm switching between partition functions, which are to do with the states of the theory, uh, the energy spectrum of the theory. And I, I just talked to you about uh, constructing EFT Lagrangians in some sense, but I can, I'm free to do this because it's a free theory. Uh, it's, it's, it's conformal and I can use, uh, I can appeal to the state operator correspondence. So I can use these words interchangeably here. Okay. So this is really a partition function of the free uh, theory. And I'm just going to, just for simplicity, let's just, uh, just stick with all, uh, all uh, states in the theory. So they don't have to be Lorentz, uh, Lorentz um, singlots, just, to, just to, for ease of presentation. But really, of course, we're gonna be interested as well in the Lorentz singlet sector, which is the, the, the overlap with the S matrix, the non-zero S matrix of the theory. Uh, okay, so, um, this partition function, in terms of degeneracies, is often written uh, instead of being as a function of q. So this is a polynomial in q. Uh, the, uh, instead of written as q, you often write this as e to the minus uh, beta or e to the minus inverse temperature uh, to, to get the, 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 the partition function of the theory. Uh, and we're going to be interested in how this grows. So we're interested in how the states grow uh, and how the degeneracies grow at, uh, at large uh, n here. And at large n, that tells you that this, this sum is going to be dominated by uh, the, uh, the terms where if I set beta goes to zero, or equivalently, if I set q here goes to one, then this sum is going to be dominated by the, the terms at the, the very edge of this, uh, the, the, the very edge of this um, n, so the high n terms can be dominated here. So I want to study this as a function of q goes to one, or equivalently, beta goes to zero. And this partition function is related to the free energy of the theory. Um, I can introduce instead of, so here is this discrete states, but let me, uh, let me change uh, and make it continuous. And so I have some, some de density uh, of, of states instead of just a, a discrete sum over these ANs, although we know that it's going to be in the end of the day, a discrete spectrum, but I can do this. There's some delta functions in this definition of rho here. And rho, the density of states is just related to the entropy in, in the following, in this way. Okay, and so we're interested in this row or these ANs. We're interested in these density of states, the degeneracy, and we're interested, uh, we're interested in this as the mass dimension goes very high. We're interested in its growth as a probe of the, of the theory. And, uh, and this, you can, you can obtain rho by just performing the inverse Laplace transform. This is just formally how to, how to get rho from the, uh, the density of states from the partition function. And again, we're interested in this as beta goes to zero. So we're interested in the limit where uh, the, the limit where delta goes to infinity, which is the, the, the inverse Laplace transform of the partition function as beta goes to zero as the temperature goes high. And that's why this is a probe of the high temperature behavior of the theory. Okay, so Cardi in 86 studied this problem for a scalar field theory in D dimensions. Uh, so a scalar has dimensions, uh, oh, sorry. D dimension. So this is the Lagrangian looks like d phi squared plus da -da 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 -da, so higher order terms in the in the EFT. And this partition function is given uh, given by the following expression. That's what Cardi showed. And this is a kind of very intuitively this is a Lego esque expression. So this is just saying that I can stick together these building blocks of phi or derivatives acting on phi. That's all I have really to play with. Just derivatives acting on phi, and I can stick them together in any different way I like. And I can glue them together. And so you can imagine you know, this, this sort of counts all the, the possible combinations of just using phi itself. If I expand this, uh, this, this function here, I get a one plus phi plus phi squared plus phi cubed and so on. Similarly here, I get one plus dx squared, uh, dx phi, dx phi squared and so on. And again, I'm not worrying about making your own singlets here. These f functions are sort of giving the, de the degeneracy. So 
uh, this this f function here is telling you in d dimensions there will be d derivatives you know, d x uh, x one up to d x d okay and so this is this is uh, this is what this function uh, this this potential function is intuitively doing is saying just glue together all these possible uh, building blocks of derivatives acting on phi. And the Cardi analyzed the d is equal to two case. So in the d is equal to two case, actually, this is a little bit simpler. So the partition function uh, reduces to the following form. So it's just a product on k of one over q to the k uh, all squared. Now, this partition function here, you can relate to the uh, Dedekind eta function. So there's just by the definition of this, you, you, you could you just rearrange this formula to, to get the definition of the, the Dedekind eta function. Uh, this, uh, this is the Eta function is a generating function um, of integer partitions. And so if you're familiar with uh, the asymptotic growth of in inter part integer partitions, there's a very famous formula due to Hardy and Ramanujan as to how the number of inter uh, integer partitions grows with n, the asymptotic, there's an asymptotic formula for it. And so you know that there's an asymptotic formula for this uh, and, and, uh, and, and you can use that to understand the, the growth of operators because the partition function is simply related to the, the asymptotic growth of integer partitions in this case. And so you can, you can, you can uh, either use that reasoning or you can do a, uh, um, just go down a more pedestrian route and you just you do it, you perform an inverse Laplace transform of this and either way you get this, this, this expression for the, the density of states. So the degeneracy or the, it, this is equivalent essentially to these ANs, the, de the degeneracy of, uh, of operators in the EFT, or again, the degeneracy of the number of possible measurements you can make in your theory or S matrix elements. And, uh, and, and this, is, this is indeed, this, this, this is the, uh, the, this form, this exponential uh, form is, is what you get out of the hardy ramanujan formula. And as you see, there's exponential growth as we would expect. Okay, so uh, in in my recent paper uh, with Sridip, um, our results were to generalize this in, in a number of directions, and so we generalized uh, a theorem from from mathematics due to Minardus. Uh, this is a theorem from the fifties uh, to to obtain results for arbitrary dimensions, so going beyond d is equal to two, for arbitrary spin particles, so moving beyond uh, scalar fields, so including spins of arbitrary j. Uh, and also picking up all subleading terms. So um, really not just doing the leading analysis, but getting all the all the corrections to the, the to the to the leading term, the leading growth of these, uh, all the way down to uh, the the sort of um, uh, the log the, the log terms in the free energy. We also understood the projections to subsets uh, of of the operators. So for instance, what happens if you don't want to just calculate all uh, operators in your theory, or all states in your theory, but you want to restrict to the Lorentz singlets, as is relevant uh, for the for the S matrix, or as relevant for the EFT, or if you want to restrict to internal symmetry singlets as well. And again, as is relevant for the S matrix, you you write down operators that are gauge singlets, or uh, you write down S matrix elements that are, are, are gauge singlets. And so this is instead of using the partition function in the free theory, you're using this Hilbert series, this blueprint that uh, that I introduced in, in earlier in the talk. And in fact, all of these generalizations are necessary to study the growth of, uh, of the degeneracy of the standard model EFT. And so the, the standard model EFT, the standard model as a QFT is a, is a, is a pretty complicated one. Uh, and you need to know, you know, you need to, uh, you need to know, you need to have all these, uh, these generalizations in order to, to do this analysis. And so here we're, we're considering, you know, L, the Lagrangian is L standard model plus all these higher order terms. And, and we want to understand, uh, and we want to apply the, this, this, the, I find an asymptotic formula for the growth of how many terms there are in this, in, in this EFT. And so here's a table of just the standard model field content and you know, how it transforms under Lorentz uh, symmetry and, uh, and the, the various gauge groups in the standard model and everything has to be a singular under, under all of these things. So, uh, okay. And so we can finally ask the question, standard model, standard model, quite contrary, like the nursery rhyme, how does your, how does your S matrix grow? And this is the this is the this is the answer that we get, and so this plot is the same plot that I showed you uh, before. Uh, uh, along the x-axis uh, is mass dimension. Along the y-axis is 
number of independent operators, so this the density of operators here, this row of lambda, a uh, row of delta, sorry. And so these solid lines in the plot here are the the actual data plot, actual data points. You can see them zigzagging up. Uh, again, for one generations of fermions, and again for three generations of fermions. And then these uh, solid gray lines here are uh, lines corresponding to the following formulas. So these are the formulas that we, that we obtained using these generalizations of, 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 um, of these asymptotic, uh, asymptotic methods. And to me, at least, uh, these, are, these, are, these are pretty exciting numbers. I mean, I, I never thought I would write down a, an equation that looked quite like this. Uh, uh, and, you know, they, they also, these are asymptotic formulas. These are, these are exact, in, in, they're exact in the sense that the error uh, between this formula and the, the, actual, the actual number, the data, the error goes to zero as, uh, as delta, the mass dimension goes to infinity. So these, these really encode something intrinsic about the, the standard model. And I'm not saying this in the sense that, you know, you should go into numerology and look for deeper meaning in, in, you know, in, the, in the number 217. But what this is telling you is it is, it is telling you how, you know, the standard model, it is a probe of how the standard model uh, behaves at, at high energies or at uh, high, high mass dimensions. It's a, it's a, it's a result that is, uh, becomes exact in that limit. So given the fact that it's an asymptotic formula, it happens to fit the low mass dimension remarkably well. So we, I guess we weren't expecting this. So this, this, this crazy looking formula, you just stick in delta to 5, 10, 15, 20. Uh, and it really explains the low mass dimension extremely well. So here I'm plotting the ratio of data uh, over this, this asymptotic formula. So even down at sort of uh, mass dimension 5, 10, this is, this is order one. Order one correct is, 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 is rather wonderful. So this is what I was trying to get to in this talk. You know, this is one way uh, of understanding this blueprint. It's an analytic result, and it tells us something. It tells us one direction at least, something about the structure of the uh, of the blueprint of the the, the standard model, uh, the S matrix of the standard model, or the standard model EFT, whichever whichever language you like to uh, you like to use. Uh, and so this is a new result. Uh, you know, this is this is this is uh, um, just starting to explore what you can do with these Hilbert series, with these with these blueprints. And so, in that sense, we really just wanted to show that we could apply it to the to the standard model. Because if, if you can apply it to the standard model, you can apply it to anything because um, uh, it has the right uh, amount of complexity. Um, but let me say, uh, I'll say in a couple, well, in my conclusion slide, in fact, on the next page, that uh, uh, you know, moving beyond this as well, uh, why why this kind of uh, analysis might be interesting beyond just doing this and seeing how it works. Okay, so that brings me to my conclusion. So uh, there were two parts to my talk. I was talking about this this blueprint for the for the um, the S matrix and how this can help you, uh, or how how this can allow you to probe uh, the QFT. In particular, I focused here on the standard model EFT. So part one was that this blueprint, this Hilbert series uh, for the for the EFT or the S matrix solve some, some genuine problems uh, that, were, that, that existed in phenomenology. Uh, in particular, it solves this operator enumeration problem in the standard model EFT. It gave it the first determination of uh, the, the mass dimension eight part of the standard model Lagrangian. These, these standard model EFT measurements are, will be a legacy of the high luminosity LHC uh, program. And so they will be around until you know, the, next, the next collider is built. And so they're a very important measurements are important legacies. I'll say a little bit about dim, uh, dimension eight operators. So dimension eight, just by power counting, is dimension six operators squared. And uh, dimension six, and there's a typo here, this should be dimension six squared, is already used uh, in, in the fit by the experimental collaborators. So for instance, extracting the dimension six operators, they, they include uh, in that extraction, a, a piece that goes like dimension six squared. So this tells you already that that's at the same order of dimension eight. So dimension eight should be necessary in this in this extraction. So you need to you need to understand the dimension of, uh, the dimension eight part of the the Lagrangian in order to in order to say something about this extraction or something about errors. And indeed, there are also cases where dimension eight terms can be can be important relative to dimension six terms. So it seems that the dimension eight story uh, and um, these 993 operators, or some subset of them, will, will play some role in uh, a phenomenological role in, in, in the LHC and MSCs. Another thing that I want to mention is that these, these Hilbert series, uh, these, uh, these um, or a knowledge of like how this operator base 
basis works, this for the knowledge of how a comb works and, and the organizational uh, principles. There's also of use in um, in uh, precision calculations. So we're actually going and doing the, the the calculators and the FT that you need to extract these Wilson coefficients and going beyond leading order, going into loop calculations uh, and extracting these coefficients. So they, it, these Hilbert series also play a role there. The challenges are different. So loop calculations have made uh, tremendous progress for the for the LHC. Um, the challenges here are different. The challenges are, or, or you know, an obvious challenge is just the, the large number of, uh, of operators. And so the Hilbert series uh, approach can, can sort of systemize that aspect of it. And there, there is a sort of intersection with, with the precision and the loop calculations that is there's an interesting story. And so I did focus on the standard model EFT, but there's also applications to other phenomenological EFTs. So for instance, uh, recently with my collaborators, we, we applied this Hilbert series technique to the QCD chiral Lagrangian, which is a little different because uh, it has a non-linearly realized uh, symmetry. Uh, but again, Hilbert series techniques can solve enumeration problems that existed there. And uh, upcoming work will apply it to the nonlinear Higgs uh, effective field theory, which is uh, which is relevant for the LHC phenomenology as well. So again, there's an enumeration issues there that we can we can solve systematically using this approach. And then the second part of my talk was this exploration of uh, what of the Hilbert series is really as an analytic tool to study uh, EFT or probing uh, S matrices, if you like. And so we sort of generalized this Cali formula. Uh, for asymptotic growth in many different directions in, in terms of space time dimensions, in terms of field content, in, in terms of like looking at subsets with, with uh, singlets and uh, the rent symmetry or under internal symmetries. And uh, we, we, we found ways to, to sort of obtain these sort of more generalized uh, hardy ramanujan type formulas for, for the asymptotic growth of these operators. And so we're currently thinking about you know, how this can be useful. And one, one potential way that this can be useful is, as, uh, is to study the convergence properties of observables. So the, the, the growth of the degeneracy in the S matrix, um, or the, 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 oper you know, the S matrix is one way of expanding any observable that you, you, can, uh, that you can measure. You can do some basis expansion. And uh, the convergence of that, I mean, it's a physical observable, observable is an observable, it has to converge. But we know now the asymptotic growth of these operators. And this must place some bound on the, on the at least naively, on the, the value of the, um, the coefficients of this expansion. So the physical sort of coefficients rather than just the, the basis itself in order for this full observable, the function that describes the full observable to, to converge. And uh, also considering whether, whether these, um, considering whether these uh, formula can give you any useful in, in, uh, input to, to ideas to, uh, to bootstrap the S matrix. But these are, this is very much work in progress. So I'd like to leave it there. So thanks for your attention. Center questions. I have a couple of questions. Can you hear yes. me? I can just about hear you. Yeah. Um, so, what happened if you uh, impose supersymmetry? Can you get something interesting? Yeah, that's a that's, that's a very very good question. So that's something that we're looking into at the moment. So supersymmetry should be imposable in 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 a in a Hilbert series. Uh, framework. So I think this is something that can be treated by similar methods. Now there are many there are there are there are many indices that are studied, this is like indices in supersymmetric theories that have a very similar flavor to this, uh, to these Hilbert series. They look like some some sort of weighted sum, some partition function type sum. Uh, and these indices are, are protected in this sense. And so again, you know, studying the asymptotic behavior of these indices is 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 important. And uh, you know we we uh, develop this Maynardus theorem in order to, to sort of get the, the generalization to these subleading terms and, and in fact to capture all subleading terms. And this was a sort of new, this is new, um, this is new input uh, from the sort of mathematics literature to, to, to apply it to this, to this problem. Uh, and so, yeah, one thing we've been looking at is whether we, you know, whether these subleading corrections are important, whether that can give useful in, input to, to some of these analyses in, in supersymmetric theories. It's less clear uh, that, it, that it can yeah. be because because yeah, we have know. a yes. Thank you. Yeah, we have a question here. Uh, yeah. So I wonder, did you find the sequence you generated in the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, or no? It was not there. 
So which 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 particular signal? You mean the standard model? Yeah. Yeah, Not yeah, no. Model, the other one, the real. You are showed two plots, right? Going up with numbers. I didn't. Yeah. You mean the, 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 these ones? Yes. If you put this, what? Yes. <laughs> guilty. Yeah, yeah. I'm guilty. I, I did. I did. I did do that. <laughs> but uh, of course, no. There's no. There's nothing. Not there. Nothing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? So uh, one more question. So at the beginning, you talk about special conformal symmetry. So uh, palletation is not in the game, so or not? What is not in the game, sorry? Uh, Deletation. You mentioned a special conformal. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, of course, that, that, yeah, indeed. So that, that, that's one of the generators. Um, uh, right. But the way that this is set up is that the, the, um, the sort of uh, the raising and lowering operators are the total derivative and the, the special conformal generator here. So yeah, this 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 is absolutely that that operation is there. I mean, it's, yeah, that action is there, but uh, we don't have to use that in order to. to the, the 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 simple statement is that we want to we want to count conformal primary operators. That's the that's the main statement, and so that's all we need. Okay, thank you. No more questions. So uh, we thanks uh, Thomas again. Thanks for a nice talk. So have Thank a good you. day. So last part of this session.